Let me just uh, give a brief introduction. Uh, Dr. Melissa Allen Dumas is a research scientist in the Computational Sciences and Engineering Division at Oak Ridge National Laboratory and leads the impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability theme within the Climate Change Science Institute. She holds a PhD in Energy Science and Engineering, an MS degree in Environmental Engineering, a BME in Music Education, violin, and a private pilot license. Her expertise includes global model modeling and analysis of atmospheric species, transport, statistical and dynamic downscaling of various climate model output, and analysis of direct and indirect effects of climate change on electricity demand and on other national and civic critical infrastructures. Welcome, doctor. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> I appreciate that. Um, one of the things that, um, that I wanted to talk about today, and this was uh, actually, I've got to give the credit to Najib who, who suggested that, that maybe there could be a talk that incorporated um, my whole background, which is a little bit strange. Um, I originally started out as an orchestral violinist and a violin teacher in the public schools, and um, ultimately made a transition into environmental engineering in midlife. And so, um, one of the things that was a little bit difficult for me is I did not know if really anything of the first 20 years of my professional life would apply at all uh, to the next part of my professional life. But I began realizing uh, not too far in that there are a lot of similarities uh, between the music world and the scientific world. And certainly um, in the realm of uh, interdisciplinary research in both areas, there's, there's a definite overlap. Um, my colleague that's listed here also is um, Diana Skinner, and she is a violinist and a mezzo-soprano that I met in Knoxville uh, somewhat recently, and she and I collaborate together in um, a string quartet and a flute quartet, and um, she has worked with me on this presentation and, and given a lot of really great insights from, from her career up to this point. So I will, um, I'll move further and, and explain to you sort of what I'm talking about here. Um, so we'll talk today about, and I'm going to have to kind of come over here a little bit, talk today about, um, about how you create interdisciplinary research um, in an orchestral setting, and then we'll make the analogy back to how you uh, create that in a, a project setting um, with a, a group of uh, different scientists who are coming together to, to collaborate on a research topic. So first of all, I think it's important that um, the person that is the PI or the person who is the conductor that's, that's leading the program create sort of a culture around what the, um, what the study is. Now, uh, we, I think, have an overarching culture in both areas. I think in the, in the orchestral world, it's expected that you are going to go to a rehearsal and be prepared with your part, and it's expected that uh, you will follow the procedures that are usually uh, taken in an orchestral rehearsal and in a concert setting. And likewise, I think as scientists, we, um, there are certain expectations that we hold of ourselves and of the scientific community. We expect that everyone is going to be following the scientific method. We expect people to check the uncertainty of, of their conclusions. We expect the people to be precise in, in the way that they do their research and in the way that they present it. So, um, so there's already that sort of a, um, an analogy back and forth. So the culture around it, the overall arching culture, and then within each project there will be a certain way that people work together. Um, then uh, one of the things that the next thing we'll talk about is not missing the music. Um, and I'll get a little a bit more specific about that when we get to that particular section. Um, but sometimes things that we have an idea in our minds um, about what we think music is. I think every one of us uh, has a certain type of music that we prefer and a certain label that we would give to some music. There would be some music that some people, some uh, sounds that people would consider to be music that we ourselves would think that is not music. And yet, if we open our minds um, to some of the um, the varieties that we're not used to, we can we can find a lot of interest in those different areas. Likewise, in science, there may be uh, ways of incorporating um, ideas that we had not thought about before, that we have, might not have thought had gone together, we might not have thought that they organize well together, and yet that could be a really rich area to explore, especially with an inter interdiscipl uh, interdisciplinary approach. Um, and then finally, uh, one thing that we all um, need to do, and, and part of what makes 
um, our science part of a community is that we acknowledge the players that are, that are involved. We acknowledge the contributions that the individuals give and we acknowledge the community in which we're able to present these things. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, so we'll talk first of all about uh, creating a culture. I have this guy's uh, picture here. His name is uh, Itai Talgum. He has uh, labeled himself a conductor of the people. He used to be a, um, an actual orchestral conductor in Israel, and um, he came to the United States, I think still does some conducting, um, but then has realized himself, too, that there are a lot of analogies in uh, conducting in business and, and different organizations of groups. And so his, his thought is that, um, it, that he would like to present the idea of, of leading like an orchestral conductor um, in, a, in other types of groups. <clears throat> so I'll reference him a little bit through this section here. So, um, so one of the things, we talked a little bit about individuals being prepared, and um, I re was really appreciating um, in Grandin's talk the idea about this reductionist learning. Um, and even though uh, he had showed that that was sort of an old way of approaching things, in the music world, that is absolutely still um, a really good way to go about things. There can be very hard passages to play, things that are just difficult to get your fingers around, and if you can take one measure, one small part of that piece of music and really rehearse that well and put it back into the context, then you've solved a whole lot of problems by just solving a small problem. And I think we do that still today in the sciences in math, uh, where we take one small part of that multi-level equation and just get that one thing worked out and put that back in and that gets us at least to the next step. So that's the way that uh, musicians organize their practice time. That's how they are efficient to get their parts learned in time. Um, and that is expected of them, that they will be prepared to put their part together um, with the rest of the orchestra, <clears throat> excuse me, at the first rehearsal. But also there's some other things about understanding the ensemble as a player. Um, you want to know as you're playing the piece, who has the solo line? If it's not you, get out of the way. Let that solo line be heard. Um, if you are the accompaniment, make sure that what you're doing with the accompaniment is supportive of that solo line, not that you're off doing your own thing or thinking your own, um, thinking about your own ways of playing those notes. That needs to be supportive of the solo line. Um, in the, uh, you'll notice in, a, in an orchestra, and I'll show you some pictures as we go through, but there's a whole lot of people who are playing stringed instruments that are played with a bow. And um, as you go to an orchestra concert and you see it being performed, all of those people that are playing instruments with bows have their bows going in the same direction. And that's not an accident. Somebody in the section decides which direction the bow is going for every note. And usually that's the, the section leader. But as a section player then, you need to make sure that your bowings are matching the section leader and that the whole orchestra then can play as a group. And in fact, I've, I've forgotten now which orchestra it was, but there was one conductor who was absolutely um, insistent that everybody was not only going the same direction of the bow, but was exactly in the same part of the bow as they were playing. So if you were not three inches away from the bottom of the bow, you were in the wrong place and you would get called out and say, ah, get in the right part of the boat. So, um, so there's, there's that, uh, just that sort of um, um, coordination. And then, um, then also musically preparing entrances and exits of players. And I thought this was particularly appropriate to people who are um, directing projects because we uh, often as, as PIs will have Gantt charts. We'll have a plan of, of who needs to turn in what part of the work at what time so that the next person who needs that data, who, who needs that model output or whatever it is, can then do their next part. And that's all built into the, to the score um, of a musical composition for us. We know um, if you, uh, in your preparation for, for the uh, performances, you can have a, um, a whole large page of everybody's part. And you can see where one person comes in and then where you come in and then where the next person comes in. And there's, um, Having that awareness of who follows whom and how you set their part up for them as the person who is leading someone in or how you receive the part from the person who has just played, that's all a very important part about making that music happen and making that make sense to the audience. And so likewise, with our projects, we need to get the timing right and make sure that everyone is able to play their part as best they can when it shows up. Um, so there's some different, pro different project leadership styles, and we've all been in different situations where we've had maybe a leader that, that's been really good, really encouraging, we really feel like we can just do our best work with that person as a leader, and then sometimes maybe we've had leaders that 
that we uh, were not as comfortable with or we didn't quite um, see the things the same way that they did. We have to try to figure out how to work with those people. Um, but there are a lot of different leadership styles and there are a lot of effective leadership styles. Not, there's not just one that only works. Um, and so there's an example here that, um, that uh, Itai Talgum gives of, of four different conductors. And it's really great if I, I think I have, yeah, there's a um, URL down there if you want to see his TED talk. It's really, really great. And he shows actually examples of these conductors leading the orchestras. And so I'm not going to be able to uh, give you, you that today. But I can tell you a little bit about some of the different conducting styles that these different um, conductors have. So there's a, an Italian conductor named uh, Riccardo Muti. And he is known for being very, very meticulous about every detail. And he insists that you do it exactly his way. And if you are just the slightest bit off, um, not only do you hear about it right then, there are consequences later on. You absolutely must do it his way. And, um, and that works. That it may, he makes sure that his people um, do what they are supposed to do at exactly the time that they are supposed to do it, and the concerts are very well done and, and uh, you know, the highest level. However, uh, that's maybe not always the best strategy for everyone. And in fact, he was um, fired from the La Scala. La Scala is a very famous opera house in, in Milan. Uh, he was fired from the La Scala by all 700 musicians. And what they, <laughs> what they said to him is, you're a great conductor, but we don't want to work with you. Please resign. <laughs> So he was maybe doing a little bit too, maybe insisting a little too much that everything had to be exactly his way. But the reason that he did that is um, that he felt a real responsibility. It was not that he was trying to antagonize people. He had a, felt like he had a real responsibility. And when asked about that, he says, I have a responsibility to him that we get this right. And by him, he didn't mean God, he meant Mozart. But he wanted to make sure that he absolutely got things right according to what the, the composer wanted. Um, the next guy is named Herbert von Karajan. He's a conductor of the Berlin Philharmonic. And if you see the, the, the footage of him conducting, you see that he does something sort of like this. And um, people sort of wonder, well, what, what's he really doing? What, what does that even mean to anybody? Because most conductors are more precise this way, and you would get you know, a clear beat from the conductor. But uh, von Karajan is just sort of, sort of like this. And um, so it was interesting to me to understand the take on what that really meant to the musicians. Um, they really don't know what he means either. I mean, we as, you know, if, you, if we're, we're in the audience, we may not know what that means, but the musicians don't either. So the way they communicate with each other to get the job done that, that is needed is they sort of look at each other and say, okay, what do you think he needs? Um, and they, they sort of um, communicate together with their instruments and ah, then they, they all are together. So, um, so Karyon sets up that uh, almost ambiguity on purpose to make sure that, that people are communicating with each other and getting the job done. Um, the next one is Richard Strauss, um, and he was uh, Viennese, and he was um, still living with, when the footage was being taken of, uh, well obviously if, if footage is being taken of him and he's doing something, he's living, but he, um, he's, he was living well into the 20th century, um, but wrote a lot of um, music at the end of the 19th century. And he was actually in this footage conducting his own piece. And one of the observations was that he had the score there in front of him. He had all of the notes that he had written and he was looking down often at that score and you know giving the cues to the orchestra and conducting. And um, so somebody thought, well, why are you looking at your own score? Um, don't you know your own music? And yes, he did know his own music. But what he was doing was symbolically showing the orchestra that what was on the printed page was indeed what he wanted. And that's all he needed to do was to just make sure that he was looking at the score and communicating that out. And so he was doing that in a, in a sort of an unspoken way, an un almost undirected way, but it was implied and understood by the musicians what he was communicating there. And the last one is Leonard Bernstein. Um, and he was uh, a, a, a character in, in the New York scene. He had conducted the New York, New York Philharmonic for many, many years. And um, he did a lot of uh, different things really with just his personality. He had a very dynamic personality and um, he certainly could conduct and give the correct beat, and he certainly knew how to gesture to get the dynamics he wanted, but there were times when he just didn't do any of that. There's, there's footage of him just folding his arms like this, holding the baton just like this, and with his eyes sort of cueing the different parts of the, the orchestra. 
And, and what that showed uh, with him was that there is a, a certain amount of trust, or a large amount of trust, that he had in his people to play the music the way it should be played, and that really he was there to facilitate and not to you know, be imposing. So, um, so four different examples of great leaders, all who got really great results from their groups, but four very different leadership styles. <clears throat> so, um, and I think anytime we're in a situation where we're working with other people, you could almost think of it as a type of ensemble. So um, a couple of examples here that I have are uh, people that just facilitate the collaboration. And a lot of that can just be the collaborators themselves. Are you f helping to facilitate um, what's going on in, in what you're doing? Um, likewise, also a, a PI or a conductor could, could um, uh, facilitate as well. But a couple of examples here. Um, there's this, a mezzo-soprano mezzo by the name of Janet Baker um, who was talking about a very famous um, composer, conductor, and pianist who um, was uh, well known in the, in the 20th century, wrote lots of interesting music, but she had the opportunity to collaborate with him. And he was somebody who, because of his, his name and his stature, and the, the fact that he was very, very well known, um, could have been any kind of demanding that he wanted to be, just because he should have the respect of everybody in the community for his accomplishments. But he wasn't. You can see what she uh, said about him. He didn't push you or lead you. He anticipated what you were going to do and um, that was accompaniment of the highest order. So he, in working with other people, again, made sure that, that the, the music was brought forth and, and, um, and communicated rather than tried to impose any, anything. Um, so this next part here, and I might just kind of let you read it while I explain a little bit of the background there, but um, my, my friend Diana, who had helped me with this presentation, um, was recently doing a performance in which she was um, singing a, a solo as mezzo-soprano, and she had an accompanist who um, was the piano professor at the university. I'm, I'm from Tennessee, so the University of Tennessee professor of piano was accompanying uh, my friend, and she was a little bit uh, nervous the first time she was going to work with him because she didn't really know <laughs> what to expect, and she thought, well, I need to make sure to tell him I take time here, and then I you know, want to get really soft here, and I want to do these various different interpretive things, and I'm, I'm hoping that I can explain this well enough that he can catch what I'm trying to do and, and all of that. And, um, and then she uh, sort of took a step back in her mind and thought, well, maybe I don't need to try to be that detailed with it. Maybe actually he's got some ideas that he can bring to this as well, and maybe we need to, to be collaborative about how we do this. And she said, not only did that happen, when she, she started immediately, it was the same sort of situation where it was as if they were just walking together. And uh, you, we all know as we're walking and talking with people, we just sort of kind of sense the direction that people are going and, and kind of walk with them. And we're talking and we're communicating. And she felt like, like that situation was very much that way as she was doing this performance and really felt like that was sort of the essence of collaboration. <clears throat> So now we get to the part of don't miss the music. Um, this is another composer by the name of Charles Ives. Um, we'll talk about him a little bit, but let me just give you a brief background on him. He was, a, again, a 20th century uh, composer of art music. And the thing that he brought to that sort of table was um, this idea that uh, you don't have to have a single line of music um, alone with accompaniment, or for that matter, you don't even need to have uh, several different lines that specifically harmonically fit together. His idea was you might, it might be music to say, here's a, 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 a melodic line going on over here, here's a completely different melodic line going over here in a completely different key with completely different rhythm, and yet here's a third one. And he got this inspiration because as he was growing up, he lived in a, um, in a house or an apartment or something that was on the corner on one corner, and on the three other corners, there were three different churches, and on Sunday morning, all of the bells would chime different tunes for each church, and they would all chime together, and it would sound maybe like a cacophony, but he kind of thought that was interesting, and so he tried to incorporate things like that into his music. So you'll see um, how he approaches um, music and, and collaboration. So, but first of all, um, let's talk a little bit about um, what this music is. This is the, the um, harmonious, uh, sounds of simultaneous stories being told all together. 
And, and again, uh, Grandin talked about uh, stories and, and how, and, and I forget who, which one of you was saying that that was how you uh, approach your classroom in terms of telling stories. Well, that's what music is all about, is telling the stories of, um, of times past or of times present um, and relating uh, to the world in a way that's different from what we normally do. So we have um, each orchestra that, that's playing has a whole history that's behind it. So there's a story that's there when you walk into the concert hall. Um, the concert hall itself has a story. It has an architect, it has a builder, it has all of, all of these components um, as part of it. Um, every composition has a composer who lived in a certain time and experienced the, um, the sort of what we now call the history, but experienced that time. That's incorporated into, into the composition. Um, each instrument has a maker that lived during a certain time. Um, we are all probably familiar with the Stradivarius violin, but there are all kinds of different um, makers that, that really figured out how to do um, their craft really very well. Um, and that's, that's um, brought to this story by each of the mu musicians who have those instruments. Um, each audience member is living a life. Each audience member brings their experience from from the day or from their, their lives to the performance. And so all of these things come together to um, make this artistic realization happen in the minds of the audience and in the presentation of the performers. And then likewise, each scientific accomplishment has a similar set of contributors. Um, and each accomplishment is going to reflect not just the science, but also the ideas and the values of the people that, that um, did the work. <clears throat> Um, and then I think we had I talked a little bit as I introduced um, Charles Ives about that perfection may not be the goal of some of this uh, research that we do. Now, now getting um, some insight and getting um, some new um, understanding always is, but maybe perfection isn't. And in fact, um, this uh, so being being able to welcome these different. Um, different types of sounds and being able to hear them together as an integrated whole, even though it may not be what you originally thought should be, um, should be the answer to what you uh, received, or what you, um, what you produced. Um, so, but uh, on the music side, beauty and music, Ives wrote, is too often confused with something that lets the ears lie back in an easy chair. Many uh, sounds that we are used to do not bother us, and for that reason, uh, we're in, um, inclined to call them beautiful. So we don't want to just be um, scientifically just sitting in our easy chair thinking, well, all right, if it, if it seems beautiful or if it seems recognizable or if it seems like, uh, you know, e to the i pi equals negative one, that elegant, you know, then it's just not science. We, um, there's all kinds of difficult problems that we're working out, all kinds of complexity that we're working through, and it may not be that the, the simplest, most elegant thing is uh, the answer that's, that's the, right, the right answer or the um, best answer. <clears throat> and then, um, especially for the educators out there, I've got to talk a little bit about uh, sometimes you write your own arrangement. So um, this picture is showing right here um, a, uh, an arrangement of a uh, clarinet, a viola, and a baseball. Um, and this is because um, the, the Metropolitan Opera House wanted to engage with the New York Mets in order to broaden their audience um, for people to, to come to their performances. And um, so they had, uh, they had some music out on the square, I think, there, and that's a picture of, of that. So what they, had, um, what they had done is they wanted to uh, make the music that, that they had all known for, for so many years and were very uh, familiar with and very um, you know, attuned to, to uh, the details of, but make that accessible to people who may not have ever really experienced that type of, of music at all. And one way to do that, uh, that, that they chose was to, to have an ensemble with a baseball there. Um, so a lot of times you'll have to, uh, um, in a university situation or even pre-collegiate uh, situation, you've got, uh, you may have a project that you started with some people um, at a certain year, and then those people have you know, all gone on and graduated, and they, they contributed their parts, but now you're getting a new crop of people in with different skills and different talents. How do you adapt that project to best use their skills? And so you kind of need to almost reorchestrate what you've done, not so much to um, you know, change uh, the rigor of your science, but to really apply the, the talents of people that, that you now have in your group. So it's important to be able to continue to think about uh, the problems that you have and recast them in different ways to, to maximize your talent. 
Um, and then, um, or there's sometimes that you actually have the opportunity to you know, start a new project, develop that project around the people that you have. But again, you wanna try to, to, to maximize the contribution of the people that are involved. Um, definitely uh, nurture and coordinate uh, the interests and the camaraderie of both the talent that you have and the sponsor of the project. Um, just as kind of an aside, back from my um, orchestral teaching days, um, I was uh, doing my student teaching in a middle school, and um, it was one of those things that as the student teacher, you don't want to intrude too much in what the, uh, the uh, classroom teacher is doing, but at the same time, you want to make a contribution and you're really excited to get out there and do stuff. So um, I had noticed one day that there was this group of these three uh, violists, these three boys, uh, they were all kind of, um, you know, kind of bouncing off the walls a little bit, but we're trying to stay contained so that they weren't, <laughs> they weren't too much of uh, you know, a distraction in the class, but I could tell that they were you know, a little bit distracted just by the, the things that they liked to do, and they were kind of bringing that into the classroom. And, and um, so I decided to talk to them and just say, so, so what brought you guys into music? And they said, well, we really like Guns N' Roses. That's just a great group, and we really like this song called Paradise City. And they would go around and they would sing it, and, and uh, that was what just really got them excited. And I thought, huh, I wonder if, um, if they would be really interested even more in the viola if they could play Paradise City on their violas. And so I wrote up a little arrangement for them and, and gave it to them, and they just loved it, and they just really started digging into orchestra and, and, and really liked that. Um, I don't know what happened from there. I don't know if they uh, ever you know, continued to, to play or if they um, you know, played, began to play um, all kinds of, of uh, you know, Guns N' Roses pieces or what, what they did. But I, um, I was excited to see that that got them excited in learning more about the instrument. And I think just sort of meeting people where, where they are and giving, um, giving them the opportunity to, to participate with the talents that they have. Um, so then finally, we, uh, we acknowledge the players. Um, when we're, we're in the group, when, when the project's finished and we present that, we make sure that we acknowledge our colleagues, we make sure that we understand the context in which the, the uh, presentation is being made. This is uh, Maestra uh, Marin Alsop acknowledging the uh, Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. She's the conductor there. And at, it's uh, traditional at the end of a concert for uh, the conductor uh, comes out, takes a bow, and then uh, extends a hand to the orchestra. They stand up and they all take a bow and, and they're all included. Um, many times, depending on the, the, the type of a production, there might be other people that have contributed to it. Um, so they may come out on stage at that time and also be acknowledged. But um, it's important to uh, understand um, or to, to make the audience aware of who all has been involved in the, in the uh, project or in the concert. Um, so this is just a couple of pictures here. This is uh, Pierre Boulez acknowledging uh, piano soloist Daniel Berenboim. Um, and this, this is after, um, after his portion of the concert. So um, usually a concert will start with an overture or kind of a short piece. Uh, the next thing that happens is that there is a soloist that's brought in and it's usually somebody who, who plays piano, violin, cello, usually those instruments, comes in and, and plays a solo and the orchestra accompanies them. Then there's intermission and then there's a long you know, symphonic piece at the end. Um, so this is right after he has played his solo portion, that's about 30 minutes of music that the soloist has memorized and plays from memory for the audience. Um, and so it's a, it's a huge accomplishment. So it is important that the conductor makes sure that that, that soloist is acknowledged for um, his work in this case. Um, and over on the other side, we see somebody being acknowledged for a solo bow. And I think this is something that I like to make sure to keep in mind because what, what this situation is here is that there was an orchestral piece that was played and within that orchestral piece, there were different members of the orchestra who had the solo line where everybody else was either not playing or there was um, just very, very low accompaniment. And it's usually a very technical part where one member plays and then goes back into sort of the orchestral fabric and then maybe later on in the piece there will be another person that, that plays the solo. Um, and so you don't, they don't stand up and do it or they don't, um, they're not really, um, they're not recognized in any visual way as that's happening, but definitely you hear the sound that they're playing. So I think it is really important for, at the end, for the conductor to acknowledge who, who it was that had played those um, beautiful and challenging um, lines throughout the piece. Um, so this just gives you an idea here. Um, again, it's just the way that the, the orchestral um, uh, bows are done at the end. Here the conductor is shaking the, the violinist's, first violinist's hand. Um, 
and just acknowledging everybody that, that was involved. But also, finally, and, and I think it's, uh, this is a very important part in um, <clears throat> orchestral productions, and likewise too, I think we need to keep this in mind as PIs and scientists that are involved, is there are a lot of people uh, behind the scenes doing stuff. There, um, there are people that are visible, there's the conductor, there's the orchestra, there's the soloist, we see all that happening, they are getting their acknowledgements. But uh, also, if you uh, look at a program, you will see somewhere um, in the program that they will acknowledge the sponsor, like the Coca-Cola sponsor, this, this concert, they will acknowledge the sponsor there. Um, they also acknowledge um, the composer here by doing really a full page write-up of what the piece was that was played, um, what um, the composer was thinking about as he wrote the composition, and then also um, uh, what, what the history of the composer himself was. And in fact, some people, um, there's a particular composer by the name of Dmitry Shostakovich that was alive um, between World War I and World War II. A lot of what inspired his writings were those conflicts, and you can hear that a lot in the music. But these program notes sort of help you uh, track what's going on in the music and track what it was that was in the composer's mind as these things were being written. And then I didn't have time to, to put more and more pages of slides of things, but, uh, but on down they give the names of the musicians, they give the names of the, the community donors, they give um, a lot of additional information about, about the orchestra and about the, the, the center. So, um, so it's important to acknowledge all of the people that are involved, even the ones that are not as visible as, as those giving the presentation. And then finally, I want to thank all of you for making this community possible and um, for having me come. Thank you.